بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما أنفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم By the grace of Allah عز وجل we come together today uh, to speak of a story from amongst the stories that took place in the life of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And I looked at the story, you know, from a, a couple of days ago. And as I was looking at the story, I was thinking, what exactly is it that I should title the lecture based on what can be deduced from the story? So, you know, a lot of titles came to my mind. So what I decided to name the, the talk is, just made it. Now a lot of things probably come to your mind, mind when you hear just made it. You know, uh, it could have been a car accident, you just made it. It could be anything, you know, you say to yourself, I just made it. So similarly, um, there was a person at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, he was... Um, of course, a young boy, young lad, and as the tradition goes in Al Bukhari and Muslim, uh, in Al Bukhari, in the Kitab al Janais, it goes as such that there was a young boy, an Anna Ghulaman min al Yahud. From amongst the Jew, Jews, he used to serve the Prophet. So you know, the Prophet وسلم, as we know, he had a number of servants. Uh, Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrating this hadith, he was amongst the people that served the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. So it's something unique that the prof, pro, amongst the servants of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam was Anas, and he's narrating, narrating this hadith about another servant of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam that used to be a Jew before. Um, and by the way, when we say a servant of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, we have to realize that what we mean is he used to serve the Prophet ﷺ, yes, but the Prophet ﷺ was greater in manner and greater in conduct uh, than for him to, you know, cause people to have difficulty in their life, even if it were to be a servant from amongst his own servants. To an extent that Anas ta'ala anhu explaining this point, he says, I went out, you know, to a uh, battle with the Prophet ﷺ, or a travel with the Prophet ﷺ. So he found that the Prophet ﷺ was serving him more than him serving the Prophet ﷺ. This is the prophetic character. Though it's a servant, وسلم, he himself is serving Anas more so, more so than who? Anas to the Prophet ﷺ. So, you know, don't get me wrong when we say servant, as in, you know, uh, you have glasses of milk or glasses of water being poured in front of him and this happening and that occurring. No, it used to be some basic tasks that the Prophet ﷺ would at times, you know, allot to these individuals so that they can have this honor of being able to serve the greatest human being and the greatest creature ever created and ever brought onto the land. Now this young man, Ghulam, from amongst the Jews, you know, he became sick, he's young. So the Prophet Wasallam he came to this young man to visit him, of course, it's a sunnah to visit the sick. And the Prophet Wasallam he began to call this young man to Islam. And as he was sitting there calling this young man, of course the young man now, you're looking at a person that has dealt closely with the prophetic character. You're looking at a person that knows the ins and the outs of this beautiful persona. This chosen persona by Allah Azza wa You're looking at a person that knows the details of the Prophet Wasallam's life. Now, on his deathbed, he's being called to Islam so you can imagine what exactly is occurring inside of his heart. And so for that reason, he looked at this young man, Yahud, you know, Yahudi. The Jews rarely ever do they convert to Islam. 
Over here, this is a Jewish lad or Jewish young man. He looks at his father, you know, almost to ask his father, is it okay if I convert type of thing? Because the Prophet ﷺ is calling him to Islam. So the father, he said, Ati' Abul Qasim. Ati' Abul Qasim. Follow the commandment of Abul Qasim, as in the Prophet ﷺ. This is the story that I was referring to where I said, just made it. So this young boy, right after he obeyed the commandment of the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. In cer certain narrations, it says that he accepted Islam. Other narrations explicitly mention the fact that he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So you know he's accepted Islam. He's followed the message of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and because of that, he's just made it. Why? Because after he accepted the commandment of the Prophet ﷺ shortly after he passed away. And the Prophet ﷺ came walking out of the house and he said, Alhamdulillah alladhi anqadahu bi bin al-nar. All praise is due to Allah Azza wa Jal, the one who saved this lad from hellfire because of me. Now, I, want, I wanted you to understand the story and have a general picture of the story. And then I call you now to listen carefully as we Look at the story point by point and deduce benefit, derive benefit and lessons from this story point by point. So you have a general stru structure in mind now. So it'll be easier for you to follow along when I say, you know, such and such occurred and what I'm trying to, you know, get to. What, what's the point that we're trying to deduce? First point. The first point. Do you not see that Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu being a person that was a servant of the Prophet ﷺ, he's saying over here, "Anna ghulaman min al Yahud," a child from amongst the Yahud, a, ya a lad from amongst the Jews, used to serve the Prophet ﷺ. Point number one: Think about the fact that all of the Sahaba, with all of the Ansar there, with all of the Muhajireen there. Would you not imagine that each and every one would fight for this status and this honor to be, you know, encompassed by their own son? Would you not imagine such a thing? Of course. Each and every Sahaba, forget their sons, they would die to go and serve the Prophet ﷺ themselves, not even their sons, not even their children. But even so, in the prophetic society, in the type of society that the Prophet ﷺ was developing, there was room for a Jewish lad, a Jewish young boy to come and work for the Prophet ﷺ. The point over here is that their society wasn't so enclosed that you know, uh, to an extent that anyone that is away from Islam, there's no way that we can even bring him home as we do. Maybe today in our societies. Here is the Prophet ﷺ delegating some of the most private and personal of tasks to a Jewish young man. A Jewish young man. And not only that, you see, not only that, but this also shows us the general rule of how a society should peacefully function, coexisting amongst one another. If you look at the life of the Prophet ﷺ, even in general, forget this particular incident, you have the Prophet ﷺ walking by, or he's on his mount, and as he's walking, or he's on his mount, he stops all of a sudden, and he sees people sitting with Jewish people. And this was incidents that took place in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Gets off, says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah to everybody sits down with them. Now over here, in this particular scenario, Abdullah ibn Ubay is there, you know, and you have other non-Muslims at that point that haven't accepted Islam, though afterwards they might have led up to, uh, to become munafiqeen, but either way, at that point they haven't accepted Islam. The Prophet ﷺ comes walking and he sits down in a meeting where there's non-Muslims sitting. 
and he sits, he converses, he talks, he recites onto them verses, he, you know, he has a friendly conversation with them. Just the way that a society should run. You have the Prophet ﷺ opening his doors when a delegation from amongst the delegations of Yahud come. Imagine a house, if you've ever seen the house of the Prophet ﷺ, imagine a house of that size. And a delegation of people come, the Prophet ﷺ opens his door and people walk in, non-Muslims. Non-Muslims. The society was, the society at that time, it was a natural society. The Prophet ﷺ wasn't going out of his way to segregate between the Muslim and the non-Muslim. Yes, there were barriers, you know. There were masajid that Muslims would regularly go to. Sometimes non-Muslims would also come in. But the type of life he was leading was a life of an individual that would, you know, socialize with everybody. Because if he didn't socialize, what would happen? How would he then be able to pass the message on? Just as he did to this boy. You know, if the boy wasn't working for the Prophet ﷺ, he wouldn't have that close relationship with this boy. So that he goes and on his deathbed. By the way, when people are dying, do they let just anybody in to come and meet him or her? They usually let the closest of the closest. They usually let the closest of the closest. So the Prophet ﷺ had, must have had some sort of rapport with this child. For him to be allowed at that point to come walk in and start talking to him. Console him. You know, speak to him, make him feel, feel comfortable. And the Prophet ﷺ used this opportunity to call to Islam. Similarly, you see that when um, a person dies from amongst them, we're commanded by, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do what? We're commanded by Allah and His Messenger to stand up for His janazah if the janazah is walking by. All of these things show that there was a certain type of behavioral practice that was established by the Prophet ﷺ that could inculcate, that could include all members of society so that society could grow together and not segregate and undermine and sideline a certain seg you know, sector of society so that you know, they go grow further and further in misguidance and as the Muslims grow further and further in hatred and animosity begins. You know, so there was ease in that society. Look for example at the, you know, the humanitarian aspect of the Prophet's dealings with when it came to for example the non-Muslims. What happens when you have an enemy inmate in any prison in the world? How do you think he's treated? He's treated probably very poorly. That's the, you know, that's the reality of the world we live in today. But that wasn't the world of our dear Prophet When the Prophet sent, you know, a um, and a battalion to go and look and explore the eastern part of Medina to make sure that everything is covered and everything is safe and the Muslims and the non-Muslims alike living in Medina are protected at their homes. They found from Banu Hanifa, they found a man that was from amongst the leaders of Banu Hanifa who was named Thumama ibn Uthal radiallahu ta'ala and when Thumama was found, of course they captured him. He was, you know, brought under the captivity of the Muslims and eventually brought to the court of Muhammad What do you think? As I said, now you're talking about a person that might have been spying on, you know, a certain nation. You're talking about a person that could have been doing anything. So he's an enemy captive, enemy inmate. The dealings for this kind of an individual are known in international law in the world, right? How do you think the Prophet ﷺ's response to this individual was? Beat him, rebuke him, you know, say nasty things to him. The Prophet ﷺ was beyond all of that. The Prophet ﷺ simply asked them, the, the Muslims, to go and tie this man up 
to a pillar from amongst the pillars of the Masjid, Masjid Nabawi. Now, as we all know, Masjid Nabawi is a very honorable place to be. So imagine being kept as an inmate in one of the most honorable places in the world. We all know that. You know, when Muslims look at the you know, places in the world, Jazakallah khair. When Muslims look at the places in the world which they, which they revere, which are the two places or the three places? Everybody knows, first and foremost, Al-Haram Al-Makki, and secondly, Al-Haram Al-Madani, Mecca and Medina. So, you have the Prophet and, and the Masjids. You have the Prophet wasallam taking this inmate and putting him where? Putting him in a Masjid. Masjid Rasulullah Tying him to a pillar from amongst the pillars of the Masjid of Rasulullah Same pillar that all of the Sahaba, as soon as they would finish Maghrib, they would run to try to pray their Sunnah behind. As you know, it comes, comes in the hadith that after Maghrib Salah, كان يبتدرون السواري That they would go right after they would finish Maghrib Salah, they would all go run towards the pillar so that they can pray, they can have a sutra, and they can pray what? Their Sunnah. You know, they can, so they can pray. So it's such a sacred situation and a sacred place. And the Prophet ﷺ ties this enemy inmate, quote unquote, into, into this kind of a situation. Isn't that honoring the person? It doesn't stop there. What happens in terms of food, in terms of clothing, in terms of all of these things? What do you think is done? The Prophet ﷺ tied this, you'd ask for this man to be tied here. He, he didn't say to him, what did you do? Why did you do? Where did you come from? What? 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 He, none of these questions. All the Prophet ﷺ said to Thumama, he said, Ma andaka ya Thumama? What is it that you want, O Thumama? Simple question. From a simple man, Rasulullah ﷺ. So Thumama ibn Uthal, considering the Prophet ﷺ as just any leader, he said to him, "In taqtul, taqtul zadamin. Wa in tunaim tunaim ala shakir. Wa in turidu al malafas al mashit." He said, "If you kill, you're going to kill a person for whom an entire nation will come and fight for. Because I'm a leader. He's a leader. So Muhammad ibn Uthal is a leader. So he's saying, if you kill me, there's going to be a problem. You know, there'll be a whole bunch of people that will not be happy with this. So you better be careful about killing me." He doesn't know the prophet, prophetic, you know, character. Prophet ﷺ isn't out to kill, kill people. So, he said, So, Thumama to Ibn Athal, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said to the Prophet ﷺ, in taqtul, taqtul min, wa in tun'im tun'im ala shakir. If you were to kill me, as in Thumama, who's the captive, he said, if you were to kill me, that you're gonna, you're gonna kill a person from whom there's gonna be, for whom there will be an entire nation that will come to combat you. Because he's a leader. Thumama is a leader of Banu Hanifa, or amongst the leaders of Banu Hanifa. And he said, if, in tun'im, tun'im ala shakir. If you were to be generous to me, you will definitely be generous to a person that will, you know, be thankful to you afterwards. I'm not gonna just forget what, you know, the good you've done to me. وَإِن تُرِيدُ mal, This is a leader from amongst the leaders of Banu Hanifa. He's saying, if you want wealth, then I'll give you whatever you want. Just ask. So the Prophet ﷺ, is he out to kill? Is he out to, you know, be generous to him? Is he, Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is he out to kill? The answer is no. Is he out to be generous? We'll find out. I gave it away, didn't I? <laughs> So, um, and then is he out for money? Is it money that he wants, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The answer is definitely no. So a day went by, and the Prophet Sallallahu said, let him be as he is. And during this day, he was of course hungry, you know, people need food. And Brother Jibreel, mashallah, he had some really nice food for us today. So, you see, the Prophet wasallam, he himself being a leader of an entire nation, he had his own household. And this is amongst the manners uh, for a person to honor another. He himself from his own household cooked food 
for this man and brought it an enemy inmate. Imagine brothers, a captive, a person that has been taken captive. The Prophet, the leader of the nation is bringing food from his own house to go and honor this person so he feels at home. Sallallahu Alaihi This is only the prophetic you know, etiquette. Nothing more. This is the mannerism of a prophet. One day goes by, another day goes by, the Prophet ﷺ comes back to him and says the same thing. He said, you know, what is it that you want? He didn't say, why, why did you do this? What were you doing? Were you spying? Were you, were you? He said, ma andak, ya Thumama. What, you, what, what was it that you wanted, O Thumama? Thumama realized through his dealings with the Prophet ﷺ in the previous day and through looking at the prophetic school, the masjid of Rasulullah ﷺ, the way people would treat each other, the brotherhood that they had amongst each other, and the way they used to smile at one another, and just the beautiful atmosphere that was there, he realized he's not going to kill me. Within one day, he realized he's not going to kill me. So he said, he didn't say the first thing, he said, تقتل, تقتل And he said, this guy is not out to kill me. He's too nice, he's bringing me house from his, food from his own house, he's not going to kill me. So he said, إن تنعم تنعم على شاكر. And that's all he said. He said, if you were to be generous, then you were going to be generous to a person that's going to be thankful for you afterwards. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, let him be. Same thing, went by, you know, same thing happened the next day. The Prophet ﷺ, sent for food to be sent to Thumama from his own household. You know, he was looking into the situation of Thumama very closely. Thumama is sitting in the masjid of Rasulullah Wasallam, listening to the recitation of Rasulullah Wasallam, looking at the behavior, the character of the Ashab of Rasulullah Wasallam, the companions of Rasulullah Wasallam, learning and understanding the behavior of a true Muslim. And then the next day, the Prophet ﷺ comes back to him a third time now. And he said, what is, what is it that you want, Thumama? So the Thumama, he didn't even reply. He said, I've already told you what I want. I want you to be generous to me. And if you be generous to me, then you'll find me thankful. You'll find me thankful. So what do you think the Prophet ﷺ did? He said, let him go. Khalas. This is what he wants. He wants us to be generous to him. Let him go. Thumama gets up, packs his bag, you know, he walks out to a certain place to find a place where he can take a shower, takes a shower, and comes back to the Prophet ﷺ and he says to him, imagine within three days, listen to me brothers and sisters, within three days, he comes back to him, after three days of seeing the Prophet ﷺ with his companions, the companions, one uh, one another amongst them, looking at the madrasa of the Prophet ﷺ, the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, three days changed the heart of an individual. He came back, he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship <coughs> except Allah, and that Muhammad ﷺ is his messenger, and none other than that. And then he said to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, O Prophet of Allah, there was not a face on the face of the earth that was more detested in my mind, that was more despicable in my mind, that was more hated to me than your face. And by Allah today, it is the most beloved of faces to me. And all of that happened because of the prophetic character. والسلام, so he wasn't out to, you know, distort society. He wasn't out to make, you know, cause instability in society where a certain class of people, they, you know, they get segregated, they get sidelined, they get put aside. No, the Prophet ﷺ had a certain way of dealing with Muslims and he had a very, very positive way of dealing with non-Muslims as well. And that's why you see, within three days this man you know, he hates the Prophet ﷺ and now he's, he says, you're the most, you have, you know, he has a father, he has a mother, he has children, but even through all of those, he still loves the face of the Prophet ﷺ more. He loves the face of the Prophet ﷺ more. And you know, the Arabs back in the days, rarely ever would they lie. 
you know, so these are some of the things that you can see from the fact that the Prophet ﷺ went to this young man, young lad, and he was Yahudi, he was a Jew. And as we said, another situation where the Prophet ﷺ's prophetic mannerism towards non-Muslim shows and appears is when the Prophet ﷺ was walking. Now this is, this shows the humanitarian concern of the Prophet ﷺ. And how it's not just about, you know, we, us, I, me, myself, and I, no. The Prophet ﷺ has a janazah walking by him. And as the janazah walks, the Prophet ﷺ stands up. Now the Sahaba, they do nothing but follow the Prophet ﷺ. As soon as the Prophet stood up, though they knew this is not a Muslim janazah, they all stood up as well. Subhanallah. As soon as they saw the Prophet ﷺ standing, they stood up as well. But then they thought maybe the Prophet ﷺ didn't know that it's a non-Muslim janazah. So should he really be standing for this non-Muslim janazah, non-Muslim funeral? So they said to the Prophet ﷺ, it's only a body of a Jew that, you know, that passed away. So the Prophet ﷺ, what do you think he replied back? And said, he said to them, Alaysat nafsan. Is this not a soul? Is it, not, is it not a human being that has died? Be it a Muslim, a Kafir, a Jew, you know, a Christian. Is it not a human being? This hadith, by the way, is in Bukhari. So the prophetic concern would extend even to non-Muslims. It wasn't just for the, you know, he wouldn't stand just for a Muslim and then sit down for a non-Muslim. This was a humanitarian concern that the Prophet ﷺ had. Of course, there was a certain type of love that the Muslims attained from the Prophet ﷺ as, the, as his followers that non-Muslims will never attain. But that doesn't mean the Prophet ﷺ used to sideline. It was, they were all his ummah. One was ummah of ijabah, those that answered his call. One was ummah that he wished for them to answer their, his call. One was ummah al-da'wah, the ummah that he was calling. They were all from his nation. But what I mean, but, you know, don't get me wrong, I don't mean they were all Muslims. I mean they were all from a nation that the Prophet ﷺ was sent to. So his concern was extending to every single person, till this day, from that nation. Be it people that accepted the call, or people that rejected the call. The concern still, still remains. Now, looking at another aspect of this story, the story of the young lad, the young Jewish man, boy. You look and you see that the Prophet ﷺ says at the end of the story, he says, Alhamdulillahi anqadahu bi min al nar All praise is due to Allah Azza wa Jal, the one that has saved him through me from hellfire. Now, over here you find that this statement of the Prophet ﷺ and this fact, the fact that the Prophet ﷺ rejoiced in this manner, it shows the truthfulness of the Prophet ﷺ. How so? Does anybody want to contribute? How does the fact that the Prophet ﷺ, you know, rejoiced at this person's Islam, the fact that this person has accepted Islam on his deathbed, how does that show the truthfulness of the Prophet ﷺ in his call, and he wasn't lying. Nobody? So I should pick some hands, eh? <laughs> okay, Ibn Abbas. Uh, it shows that he is truthful because uh, this person, if he's on his deathbed, he can't help the Prophet in any way because he's about to die. Subhanallah. His only concern is that we get saved from the hellfire before he dies. SubhanAllah, that's exactly what it is. This man, he never prayed a salah. He accepted, this, he accepted Islam, and after he accepted Islam, by moments he died. He never prayed salah. He never gave zakat. He never fought in the battles with the Prophet He didn't increase the Prophet in numbers. None of that occurred. Rather, more, difficult, more difficulty was incurred by the Prophet ﷺ for the fact that this person died. Why? Because now they have to prepare a coffin. He's a Muslim now. They have to prepare a coffin. There's going to be a Muslim burial. And that's why right afterwards, 
The Prophet ﷺ told the companions, he said, Sallu ala akhikum, go pray upon your brother, because he's your brother now, he's accepted Islam. So more difficulty will come, you know, apparently to the nation because of the fact that this person became a Muslim and did nothing for Islam. Right? But the Prophet ﷺ wasn't out to increase people in number. Wasn't out to increase his numbers and his followers. The Prophet ﷺ was genuinely out to save people from hellfire. His mission, sole mission, I mean imagine a person walks up to a man, you know, he calls him to Allah Azza wa Jal, and right after that the man dies. And he's happy about that. He's doing it sincerely for Allah Azza wa Jal. He doesn't want the person to give him money. In fact, the only relation that the Prophet ﷺ had with this man also died. Also finished. Along with the fact that he died. The Prophet ﷺ was served by this young boy. He was a servant of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ used to benefit from this boy. But he was more happy that he died, but died a Muslim, than the fact that you know, he used to benefit from it. So even the only benefit that the Prophet ﷺ was receiving in this lifetime, and the hereafter, it's a different story, from this man, had finished. But the Prophet ﷺ still rejoiced. And this shows that his da'wah was true. It was built on truth, nothing more. The other thing that can also be deduced from this story is the fact that the Prophet ﷺ was in all situations looking for an opportunity to do nothing more but then the, but, but, uh, to establish nothing more than the mission that he was sent for and that was to call people to Islam that was to call people and save humanity from polytheism to save humanity from misguidance to save humanity from becoming animals by leading lives that are like the lives of animals. Not having, you know, a connection to your Lord. Drinking, partying, girls, guys. This is the type of things, you know, when, when you have, for example, they say, if you want to breed rabbits, you bring one rabbit, you bring one rabbit, and you have ten female rabbits, and you put one over there, and they start partying. <laughs> Seriously, that's how they do it. These are animals, this is the behavior of an animal. The behavior of a human being is to be defined. Have a structure. Seriously, this is the reality of a human being. The Prophet ﷺ was sent to mankind to take them out of this animalistic you know, way that they had adapted. People were making tawaf around the Ka Kaaba naked. The Prophet ﷺ came and taught them to clothe themselves. People were literally, in, in the past especially, as people weren't educated, and even today now, people started take, to take, take off their clothes now. And taking off clothes, by the way, is amongst the direct commandments of shaitan. And amongst the same things that shaitan wants. Why? How do you know? Look dear brother, look dear sister, at what Satan did to our fathers. Adam and Hawa. Huh? So that he may show both of them, Adam for Eve and Eve for Adam, so that he may show each and every one of them their private parts. What he wanted them to do was take off their clothes. So to take off your clothes is a satanic act. Or take off parts of your clothes is a satanic act. Prophet ﷺ was brought to take these people out of this behavior. Give them a structure in their, in their lives. You like that, don't you? MashaAllah. <laughs> and then, another thing that can also be derived from the story is the fact 
that the Prophet as soon as they became Muslim, this child became Muslim, this young boy, he became Muslim. The first thing, what did he do? Ali salatu wasalam. The first thing he did, he did, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was told, was that he told the other sahaba, he told them, sallu ala akhikum. Go and pray upon your brother. So what's he trying to do over here? Ibn Abbas. Great brotherhood. You're a faqih, man. <laughs> He's trying to create brotherhood. He's trying to create brotherhood. That as soon as this person, because you know what? He's a Jew. He was a Jew. He's accepted Islam. Maybe some people that didn't have strong iman yet, they didn't realize that just the fact that he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, from now on, he's considered our brother in Islam. Right away, the Prophet ﷺ, what did he do? He went and he started strengthening that tie, that feeling of brotherhood, that this is your brother. You have certain furud, certain obligations, communal obligations towards him, even if he's deceased. You have to prepare a coffin for him. You have to bury him. You have to pray salah upon him. You have to wash him. Four of the furud kifaya, you know, furud al kifaya towards a person that dies for all believers. If a Muslim dies and there is a certain number of people, for example, a number of people are walking in the desert. Number of like 10 people are walking in the desert. One of them dies. They're all Muslims. Can they just leave him there stranded? Huh? Islamically, can they leave him there stranded? No. Even when this person is dead, because of the fact that he's our brother in Islam now, we have certain rights that we have to, we have certain obligations that we have to attend to. To wash his body. To prepare a coffin for him. To bury him and to pray Salat al Janazah upon him. Four things that need to be done. <laughs> so right away the Prophet is reminding these people, reminding these Sahaba that there are certain rights that you know you have towards this brother of yours. And with that being said, I'll stop. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين